on behalf of Columbia University's World Leaders Forum uh, and the School of International and Public Affairs uh, Gabriel Silver Memorial Endowed Lecture Series, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight as we welcome Mr. Yukia Amano uh, to speak with us today. Mr. Amano is Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. The agency, an intergovernmental organization, is the global center for cooperation in nuclear applications, energy, science, and technology. Established in 1957, the agency works with member states and partners to promote safe, secure, and peaceful nuclear technologies and prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Prior to his current position, Mr. Amano served <coughs> as chair of the agency's Board of Governors from September of 2005 to September of 2006. He was Japan's re resident representative to the agency from 2005 until his election as Director General in 2009. Mr. Amano has extensive experience in disarmament and non-proliferation diplomacy, as well as nuclear energy issues, and has been involved in the negotiation <coughs> of major international instruments. He held increasingly senior p positions in uh, the <coughs> Japanese Foreign Ministry, which he joined in 1972, notably as Director of the Science Division, Director of the Nuclear Energy Division, Director General for Arms Control and Scientific Affairs, and most recently, Director General for the Disarmament, Non-Proliferation, Science Department, which he held from 2002 to 2005. He also served as a government expert on the UN panel on missiles and on the UN expert group on disarmament and non-proliferation education. Mr. Amano contributed to the 1995, 2000, and 2005 uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conferences and chaired the 2007 Preparatory Committee for the 2010 Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. As a graduate of the Tokyo University Faculty of Law, Mr. Amano has served with the Embassy of Japan in Belgium, France, Laos, Switzerland, and the United States. The International Atomic Energy Agency serves as a global forum for scientific and technical cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear power. It provides international safeguards against the misuse of nuclear technology and uh, nuclear materials and promotes nuclear safety, including uh, radiation protection and nuclear security standards and their implementation. In the light of uh, this year's events at the Fukushima nuclear plant, the importance of this work cannot be uh, overstated. We need large-scale, safe, non-fossil fuel-based energy to meet the expanding energy, energy needs of a population which just yesterday uh, reached 7 billion and is still growing. But we cannot move full speed ahead with nuclear or any energy solution, for that matter, without the necessary protections and safeguards. And that is where the agency's key role as a leader in this field and technical advisor uh, becomes so critical. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Amano to talk about this important work. Uh, there'll be time for questions following uh, his remarks, so please hold all questions until that point. I'll uh, come up and uh, start the question and answer session. And I should mention that when we get to the question and answer session, uh, since we'd like to hear our guests' <coughs> answers, I'd like you to ask questions instead of uh, commenting on whatever, uh, whatever it is you'd like to say. So with that, Mr. Mano, please uh, join us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It was some several months ago that I received an invitation from the International and Public School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Usually, I cannot make decisions immediately. I hesitate. But this time, I decided right away to accept this invitation because I have a reason. It was some 40 years ago that I came to New York in the framework 
of uh, the program called Asian Student Leader Program. I was not the leader of Japanese uh, student movement, but um, perhaps the American embassy in Washington, made a, in New York, in Tokyo, made a mistake, and I was picked up as a student leader. It was lucky. I went to Hawaii. I visited 13 states on the East Coast, and I came to New York. I was discussing with a professor that 40 years ago, New York was a different place. It was quite dangerous, but during the daytime, my escort took us to the United Nations. We visited the conference room of the General Assembly with a podium. I met with the ambassadors for the first time in my life. And I thought, perhaps one day, I come to New York again and make a speech from the podium of the General Assembly. And can you believe me? I made it today. <laughs> I, spoke, I spoke from the podium and I explained about uh, the activities of, um, of um, uh, the IAEA. So I'm today well rehearsed. <laughs> so let me start by talking about uh, the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Since March this year, I had to use lots of time and energy to deal with the Fukushima Daiichi accident in Japan. When I became the director general, I thought, I do not want uh, that accident will happen, and especially not in Japan. But despite my expectation, accident happened, and it was in Japan. On the 11th of March, it was just after the Board of Governors. Board of Governors started on the 7th of March, and fortunately, everything went well, and we finished on Thursday, 10th of March. And then I was relaxed. In the morning, I woke up and saw uh, the CNN, and I learned uh, that an earthquake of Richter 7 occurred off the coast of Japan. As I was working in, the, in this field, I immediately thought, this is quite serious. But Richter 7 is not extremely serious. I took contact with um, uh, my special assistant and uh, ensured uh, that the incident and emergency center of the IAEA is activated. It was the case. Then I started to take um, uh, breakfast, and later I learned it was a mistake. It was not Richter 7, but Richter 9. And then came a huge tsunami. That time, I understood clearly this is a, this, there will be a huge accident. During the weekend, I worked, I recorded videotape, and starting from Monday, I briefed the member states and media on, on the accident. But information was quite limited. I didn't have enough information coming from Japan. I had to establish a good team in Vienna. And someone suggested me uh, to go to Japan, and I wondered, had I better to go to Japan, or had I better to stay uh, in Vienna? I was like Hamlet. But I decided to go to, go to Japan. One of the reasons uh, that I hesitated was that there was no appointment when I took the flight. I wanted to see uh, the prime minister, but there was no appointment. But I took the risk. And when I landed, I learned that meeting with the prime minister was, um, was set. From the airport of Narita, I went to the prime minister's office directory. And when I met him, I told him, everyone is worrying about Japan. Japan is not alone. But everyone is, is, um, everyone is supporting Japan. But everyone is worrying about Japan. So the most important thing for Japan is to tell everything to ensure the highest level of transparency. The Prime Minister nodded and instructed his staff 
to provide the information to the IAEA as a matter of priority. Later, the flow of information improved a lot. To make the long story short, I convened a ministerial meeting in June which adopted the ministerial declaration. In September, the general conference of the IAEA adopted an action plan that consists of 12 points. The situation in Fukushima Daiichi is that the assessment of the IAEA is that the reactors that were crippled are generally stable. And the Japanese government and, and the, the operator are very confident that they can bring the reactors uh, to a stable situation, which is called code shutdown. So we are moving from uh, the accident handling, uh, handling phase to the post-accident phase. What do we have to do? First, the Japanese government needs to decontaminate the off-site where people are forced to evacuate. As long as people are evacuated from 20 kilometer, 30 kilometer radials, we can never say that the accident is over. Our confidence in nuclear uh, power is restored. On the international arena, implementation of the action plan is the first priority. I do not go into details uh, that the 12 points covers, like reviewing and strengthening uh, the safety standard. Or all the countries that have nuclear power plants have to conduct so-called stress test. IAEA will strengthen its function to send international expert review missions. International response and preparedness will be strengthened. These are some of the main thrusts of the action plan. And in my view, if the secretariat, countries, member states, operators, and some others, I mean all the stakeholders, if all the stakeholders implement this action plan, nuclear power will be much safer in the near future. I would like to achieve concrete results in the coming 12 months. Accident, recovering from accident takes time. In case of um, a three miles accident, it took years to clearly understand what happened in the core. In case of Chernobyl, we don't know exactly what are the consequences, what are the real reason. Still, the world is becoming very impatient, the pace of life is fast, and um, we cannot say, please wait five years. One year, two years are the maximum of patience of the people. And if we do our best, we can do lots of things in one year or two years. What is most damaged by this accident is the confidence. So we need tangible results to restore the confidence. Next issue is what will be the future of the nuclear power? Just after the accident, Germany decided to phase out from the nuclear. Switzerland decided not to construct new, new nuclear power plants after the lifetime of the existing nuclear power plants expire. That will be 2034. And in Japan too, we, we heard a lot of things that future is very unstable. IAEA is um, making projections every year. And in light of our latest projection, I am very confident that this is not the end of nuclear power. Now we have 432 reactors in the world in operation. 
432. According to our projection, by 2030, at least there will be 90 more reactors or 350 more reactors. Now we have 432, and they will be increased by 90 or 350. This is by no means the end of the nuclear. Why it is so? In my view, the fundamental conditions surrounding nuclear power have not changed before and after Fukushima. Let's take up the climate change. Until quite re recently, all the leaders in the world said climate change is the number one problem in the world. And nuclear, nuclear power plants do not emit CO2. Fossil fuel is a very expensive resource and the price is going up and up and it has limits in its um, stock. Everyone, every country, would like to ensure energy security. These conditions have not changed. So it is quite understandable that many countries continue to maintain nuclear power as an option. In order to avoid misunderstanding, I have to add that we are not recommending nuclear power. We are not intervening in the decision of countries. It is up to each country to decide whether or not to use nuclear power. We do not intervene. But if countries decide to use nuclear power, we, the IAEA, is prepared to help them in order to let them use safely, securely, sustainably and without increasing the risk of proliferation. Next issue that I would like to take up is the nuclear security. You may be familiar of, with uh, the nuclear safe security, but to be sure, I would like to explain what I mean by nuclear security. Nuclear security means the efforts or measures to prevent nuclear material or radioactive material falling into the hands of terrorists. Some of you may argue that can happen. Is it really the case? The IAEA has a database and this database is called Illicit Trafficking Database and every year on average we receive 180 reports on the illicit trafficking of nuclear material of or radioactive materials. This year from January to July we have received 172 reports and we are not sure whether we know everything. This may be only the tip of iceberg. If this is the case, this is a real threat. Quite often people ask me, which is the most dangerous country? I can expect that they are expecting me to say some name, some country. I don't do that. But I say the country or the individual who do not recognize this risk is the most dangerous country and the most dangerous person. The reason is that terrorists always exploit the weakest link. I have this experience in my previous capacity. I was dealing with a nuclear security and when a country, country tried to procure certain material from Japan, not nuclear material, they move, they target from one port to another. When uh, the control of one port is tightened, they shift to another port. So they always, terrorists always target for the weakest link. So we need to get prepared. How can we get prepared? One, 
way is to collect information, as we are doing. If you know, if you have the information, you can analyze the trend. And based on this data, you can establish the response. This is the basis. And when you understand the trend, next thing is to train people. The IAEA have trained since 2002 over 10,000 people. IAEA is not a huge developing or development organization, but from time to time, we provide equipment. You, have not, you may not have um, seen the nuclear detectors. I didn't bring it today, but um, it is um, like this. A little bit bigger than this. It costs about 1,000 euro, and it is very effective. If you have some, someone has nuclear material, I can, I can detect it with this equipment. More sophisticated equipment cost more, but an equipment of the size of um, BlackBerry costing 1,000 is effective enough. There are lots of um, important events in the world. In the past, Beijing Olympics, or World Football Game, or next year, we'll have London Olympics. IAEA is training people and providing equipment so that terrorists would not abuse these events. I'm sure that you will see London Olympics, so when you see it, Please think of the IAEA staff who are working behind the monitor. Next, I would like to talk about non-proliferation, which is one of the core activities of the IAEA. But before that, let me explain you some basic things. We have the non-proliferation treaty and except for five countries, United States, Russia, France, UK, China, all the countries are committed not to have nuclear weapons. And those countries which are called non-nuclear weapon states under the NPT are obliged to conclude agreement with the IAEA, which is called Comprehensive Safeguard. A country that concludes comprehensive safeguard need to declare all the nuclear materials and activities to the IAEA. And when we receive such declaration, we send inspectors and check if everything is correct. We check the inventory, we listen uh, to on, on the people and check everything is um, properly recorded. And then we install camera and we install seals, for example, and continue to monitor that there will be no change. If countries declare their materials and activities properly, and if our inspectors do proper job, nuclear material and activities will never be used for purposes other than peaceful purposes. But unfortunately, people sometimes conceal, conceal activities. It happened in Iraq. We, we tried, we trusted people, but our trust was betrayed. Iraq concealed activities to our inspectors and tried to develop nuclear weapons. It was before uh, the, the first uh, uh, Iraq war. The same things happened in North Korea or Libya. Now, after Iraq incident, the IAEA developed new scheme, which is called additional protocol Additional protocol is a more intrusive scheme. It is complicated, but in essence, 
says, even though a country conceals their activities, the IAEA can request that country to give us access to locations, people, and information. This additional protocol is a very effective tool for the IAEA to have confidence that all the activities and material in the country is only for peaceful purpose. Now, we have 112 countries that, are, that have brought the additional protocol into force. Let me explain about Iran. Iran is a special case. Special case because although Iran is a non-nuclear weapon state and has concluded safeguard agreement with IAEA, it concealed activities for a long time, for some 20 years. In 2003, it was found that Iran was in violation, in failure of the, their safeguard obligations. It was decided that Iran was in non-compliance with the IAEA safeguard agreement. The board decided it was in non-compliance and reported to the Security Council. And in response, Security Council adopted resolutions. The resolution contains, and there are several resolutions, but the main thrust are requesting Iran to cooperate free with the IAEA to suspend the enrichment and reprocessing related activities and implement additional, plan, additional protocols. And uh, this, um, uh, uh, this um, uh, resolution was um, uh, subsequently strengthened. Now economic sanctions or restriction of uh, the movement of people are imposed. As these um, resolutions were adopted under the Chapter 7 of the United Nations, it is legally binding. I said Iran is a special case. Special case because Iran has to implement comprehensive safeguard and other relevant obligations, which include the United Nations Security Council resolutions. But the fact is that Iran is not implementing United Nations Security Council resolutions. On top of that, we have the information that some of the activities are not declared and some of the activities may have military implications. Under this condition, I can say that Iranian nuclear material and activities declared to the IAEA stay in peaceful purposes. But I cannot give the assurance that all the materials in Iran are for peaceful purposes. That is why I am asking Iran to implement all the safeguard obligations and other relevant obligations. Since I became the Director General of the IAEA, I apply a very simple rule to all the countries. That is that all the countries have to implement the comprehensive safeguard and other relevant safeguard obligations fully. And this is a very important standard. It is not applied only to Iran, but it is applied to all the countries, Japan or Italy or whatever country, whether they are developed or developing countries. Let me talk about DPLK, North Korea. In one sense, situation in North Korea is worse than in Iran. North Korea declared to have withdrawn from the NPT, expelled our inspectors, and since April 2009, 
we don't have any inspectors in North Korea. Recently, there are reports that on the construction of light water reactors and enrichment facilities in North Korea. This is a very troubling situation. Looking from Vienna, Iranian nuclear issues seems to be the most important. As I come from the different region of the world, I know that the nuclear issue of North Korea is very serious for the security of the region and beyond. On Syria, in 2009, the facility in, at the site called Daya al -Zul. This is an, uh, the name of uh, the location in the Syrian desert. There was an installation of a facility. Was, the facility was destroyed reportedly by Israel. This case was brought to the attention of the IAEA in 2008 and the IAEA sent inspectors. But when we sent inspectors, the facility was already destroyed, cleared, and, but we could find the particles, nuclear particles. I succeeded this dossier in December 2009, and I requested Syria to accept our inspectors. But Syria continued to stonewalling. I collected information, I collected satellite imagery, procurement information, and um, by this spring, I was able to draw conclusion. There were two options. To continue to ask Syria to accept our inspectors, or to draw conclusion while I am not 100% sure why I don't have the smoking gun. And I decided to draw a conclusion because uh, the function of the IAEA is to prevent the proliferation. If our um, mission is to prevent the proliferation, it is the right thing for us uh, to draw a conclusion when we have sufficient information. So I uh, drew a conclusion that it is very likely that the destroyed facility in, at Daya al -Zul was a reactor, nuclear reactor, that should have been declared to the IAEA. The Board of Governors of the IAEA decided that Syria was in non-compliance with the IAEA safeguard, and it was reported to the United Nations Security Council. I have talked about the proliferation, nuclear accident, but let me speak, talk about more positive stories. IAEA is known as a nuclear watchdog, but in reality, we are involved in many other areas. Let me give you one example. The IAEA has an expertise in nuclear medicine and radiotherapy. Cancer was perceived as a disease by uh, 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 disease of developed countries, which is um, completely wrong. It is true that cancer is a, is a very serious disease. The death by cancer is more than tuberculosis, malaria, HIV combined. But two-thirds of death by cancer occur in developing countries, not in developed countries. And two-thirds of cancer patients come to clinic in developing countries, come too late. So we cannot give life-saving treatment. After I became uh, the director general, I went to Nigeria as my first destination. And I visited the cancer hospital. 
there I heard uh, that in the western part of Africa, women having breast cancer are ashamed of themselves, say farewell to the family, leave the home, hide themselves, and die without being treated at all. There's a social stigma. This is very inhumane. This should not continue. So I decided that cancer should be the highest priority issue in the first year of my tenure. And I have the privilege of meeting with the world leaders. So whenever I see them, I said, we should establish the cancer control in developing countries as a global health agenda. Unfortunately, we have not come at that point, but cancer in developing countries is much, much better recognized in the world. IAEA is not an aid organization, but we can train people. We can provide equipment to some extent. I was very pleased that when I went to Albania, I saw a cancer equipment, uh, cobalt equipment, donated by us. And in two, three months, they diagnosed over 3,000 people. That's a good record. But the other side of the story is that if that equipment is down, no one can be diagnosed. More is needed. And this situation exists in many African countries. Many African countries do not have any equipment at all. And to maybe to your surprise, some of the former Eastern European countries are in very bad shape in uh, this field. So we need to do more. Other example of the peaceful use of nuclear techniques is in water. Water is a very scarce resource in the world now and over one billion people in the world do not have proper access to water, to drinking water. But nuclear technique is very effective to detect and control underground water. And I, I went to Ecuador and I went to the countryside and I met with fishermen uh, on the coast. They don't know nuclear techniques at all, but they benefit from the techniques. It, was a, it is a very dry area, but now uh, they have, uh, they have um, uh, drinking water. Not only for themselves, but uh, they can offer it to the tourist, tourists. That's a very nice surfing area. And I saw lots of Americans coming to that uh, area. And other um, local people are doing very good business. The climate change is one of the greatest problems in the world. Ocean and seas are the most precious environment asset of the human beings. And we can better assess uh, the condition of um, oceans and seas by using isotopes. We have a laboratory in Monaco, and that laboratory is specialized in the monitoring of oceans and seas conditions. Nuclear techniques play a very important role in the monitoring. Another example is the algal bloom. Because of the climate change, some algae develop very easily, and that is very poisonous. If we don't prevent them grow, it will cause lots of harms, including fatal harms for the human beings. Nuclear techniques is very helpful to detect, analyze, and prevent such harms. My last example is some, uh, the production of food. I went to Peru this summer and learned uh, that highlands of Andes are 
provide very rich source of new species. People there go high up in the Andes plateau, collect new species, and develop new mutants, which are more resilient to diseases or give more important yield. This is very effective to address the food crisis. We have learned that quite recently that global population is getting over 7 billion. And it is obvious that we don't have enough food. Mutants developed by the use of nuclear techniques will be one of the solutions to address that situation. Another example is the elimination of animal diseases. In September, I attended a ceremony to commemorate the elimination of rinderpest. Rinderpest is a disease that kills animals. And it causes damage of over 1 billion US dollars every year in Africa. But by using nuclear techniques, we have eradicated rinderpest. In the history of human beings, we have eradicated two diseases. One is smallpox for human beings. Another is rinderpest for animals. And nuclear techniques was, was uh, essential uh, to this project of eradication of um, rinderpest. Now perhaps it is time uh, to conclude, but I would like to say that um, IAEA was established in 1957. At that time, perhaps the countries that were suspected of developing nuclear weapons were not the countries like GPLK or it was not Iran that have the proliferation problems. But now it is these countries that have problems. Nuclear terrorism was not an issue perhaps 50 years ago, but now it is top of the security agenda. Food security, cancer in developing countries, water shortage, all of these are problems which did not so salient 50 years ago, but they are the most important issues in the world today. So, as the Director General of the IAEA, I would like to address these issues, both the prevention of proliferation of nuclear weapons and peaceful use of nuclear techniques in the context of 21st century. And I think this is exactly the objective of the IAEA, Atoms for Peace. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Romano has agreed to uh, answer a few questions. So if you'd like to raise a question, please come to the microphone uh, and, uh, and ask it. And again, I ask for questions, not speeches. There's a mic right there. Uh, Mr. Romano, you, uh, you talked about how you could provide small devices, possibly handheld devices, to detect uh, threats of terrorism at major events such as L the London Olympics and stuff. What do you think is the biggest threat to security today? Is it small-scale terrorism at, for instance, the London Olympics or some major event, or is it large-scale bomb building by countries like Iran and North Korea? We have not detected large amount of uh, nuclear material, but uh, we have um, um, detected, or we have uh, the report of having detected uh, the highly enriched uranium. And um, uh, the highly enriched uranium was very well packed. So we suspect that this is um, a part of um, uh, the bigger amount 
we do not know how much amount is circulating in the black market, how capable terrorists are to develop nuclear weapons, but if they have uh, this uh, such material fall into the hands of um, uh, terrorists, it is easy uh, to make a dirty bomb, for example. Dirty bomb means an, uh, a uh, bomb that do not uh, explode by the uh, fusion or fission, uh, but by chemical uh, uh, chemical function. And um, if dirty bomb is used in cities like in New York, that will cause a huge panic, and uh, the uh, effect will be uh, uh, beyond imagination. Uh, we cannot identify uh, the size of bombs, but we can tell that terrorists can use nuclear material, and if they do, the consequences will be enormous. Okay. Other questions anybody would like to raise? Please come to the microphone. If uh, there are other people that want to ask questions, you can line up at the mic, and we'll, we'll take, uh, I think we have enough time for maybe three or four, depending on how long the questions and answers are. Please. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. I was wondering, what do you think is a more stable uh, scenario, to have no, to ask all the, all the countries in the end to um, get rid of their nuclear weapons, or to have a few number of countries with uh, nuclear weapons as deterrents? My answer is um, uh, very simple. Uh, the nuclear weapons uh, should be eliminated. And um, um, we need to achieve the world free from nuclear weapons. The IAEA can contribute in many ways. In disarmament, uh, we do not replace uh, the United Nations. We are not a negotiating body, but we can contribute through verification. I talked about non-proliferation because even though nuclear weapon states eliminate their weapons, suppose the non-nuclear weapon states develop uh, their uh, weapons, it is not a um, world free from nuclear weapons. Nowadays, even terrorists can develop nuclear weapons, so our fight against uh, nuclear security, uh, against terrorists having nuclear material, is conducive uh, to create a world free from nuclear weapons. And I would like to add uh, that uh, we are uh, helping uh, to establish um, nuclear weapon free zones. And nuclear weapon free zones is another means uh, to create a world free from nuclear weapons. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, Mr. Imano, thanks for coming to SEPA. Uh, you spoke of nuclear energy as a cheaper alternative uh, as opposed to fossil fuels. Do you believe that holds true after factoring in public sector subsidies and insurance policies uh, against uh, disaster? The cost and um, um, uh, risk and benefits is different depending on the country. The cost of um, uh, cost estimates of um, uh, nuclear power in Germany will be different. Uh, to that in France. There is not um, a universal cost, risk, and um, uh, benefits of, um, uh, of nuclear power. But if a country finds nuclear power is more advantageous than other sources, which is quite often the case of the judgment, we, the IAEA, would like to help them to use it safely, securely, and without increasing the risk. By the way, I have read uh, the other day uh, the uh, cost estimate of um, uh, different source of energy in Japan. Uh, oil, nuclear is lower than oil. Oil per kilowatt, 10 yen. 10 yen for, for one kilowatt. Geothermal, 20 yen per kilowatt. Solar, 40 yen per kilowatt. This is the estimate of Japan for the time being. In the future, they may change, and I don't know. But um, um, cost, risk, benefit, 
is a matter that each country needs to decide. And um, IAEA or United Nations does not provide that universal cost. But if they think it is beneficial, it is advantageous, they use it and will help them to use it safely. We'll take one final question. Okay. Uh, my question is actually about one of your uh, sister agencies, UNESCO. I'm sure you know that yesterday um, Palestine was admitted as a member state of UNESCO. And Palestine has sort of said that they will be going around to other agencies and potentially including IAEA. And I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. As far as um, are the IAEA concerned, um, IAEA is an independent organization established by its own statute. So uh, what happened in UNESCO does not mean uh, that it will happen automatically uh, in the IAEA. What will happen uh, in the IAEA depends completely, totally, uh, on the intention of member states, including Palestine. And um, I cannot speak on behalf of uh, Palestine. Okay. Um, I want to, uh, on behalf of the school and the, of international public affairs and the university, uh, thank D Director General Amano for a, a very uh, compelling talk. And I want to invite everybody to uh, what I understand is a fabulous reception out uh, in, the, in the lobby here uh, where we can chat informally. Again, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.